take five seconds and just breathe. Take the time to breathe in and breathe out. Well, hey everybody, good to see you today. I'm so glad that you're in church. We're gonna have an amazing time. We are in the middle of a series that we've entitled Breathing Room. I wanna say a big hello to our church online family and all of the men and women in all of our Department of Corrections across America. Come on, everybody. Would you put your hands together and make them feel massively welcome today? God bless you guys. Well, hey, I want to encourage you to follow along with the message today. You can do so uh, with your message notes that are on your Life Fellowship app. And you can actually email these notes to yourself a little bit later on. And as you're pulling them up, let me just remind you that we're only five weeks away from the week that changed the world. It's our Easter weekend of celebration. And it actually is going to kick off for us on our Good Friday services These are gonna be distinctly different than our Easter services and we're gonna bring you face to face with the weight of your own sin and the totality of the cross. Honestly, if you've never been a part of a Good Friday service, it's it's a not to miss event. I promise you it could be one of the most moving services you're a part of all year long and it's drastically different than Easter. And, and, And so the next day though, we're gonna kick into Six incredible celebratory services, two on Saturday, four on Sunday, and you're going to notice on Easter weekend is when we begin to change our service times, and you'll notice that we're moving our Saturday service to our Sunday venue opportunity, and it's going to be absolutely incredible. And this year, we've got some goals. So we're believing God on Easter weekend to see 3,500 people in total attendance in those services. And that's only gonna happen as each one of us reaches out and we bring somebody with us. So just the other day, Tave and I, we were talking with our neighbors and our neighbors said, hey, we'd love to be a part of that. So we've got our neighbors that are coming apart and gonna be there. And every single year, we like to have some internal fun. So if you're new around here, this Excuse us for just wanting to have fun in church. But we're not going to advertise this. This is not going to be something we're going to tell anything to the community. This is just us. That if we happen to have 3,500 people in total attendance on that weekend, myself and all of our staff, men, pastors, are going to have to sleep on the roof of this building the following weekend. Oh, yeah, that's right. Just clap. Yeah, that's clap. (laughs) I'm just telling you, my faith taps out at 3,499. So here's what we're going to do, okay? The following week, April 7th, we're going to do a massive outdoor water baptism celebration. Scores of people are going to be getting baptized. We're going to have all kinds of food. We're growing up. It's all going to be free. We're going to have outdoor worship and games and pickleball and kickball. And I mean, it's going to be pretty incredible. And after that event is done, to cap it out. If we hit it, if myself and the rest of our staff, men, are going to have to get on a lift and make the great ascension (laughs) onto the top of the the roof of this building. We'll have tents up there and we're going to have to spend the night. And so, yeah, y'all just pray with me on this one and just Ask the Lord what he wants to do, that there's no April showers that bring May flowers happening on that night. And <laughs> now, even more importantly than all that fun, honestly, is that we believe that we're going to see 350 people go from death to life. That's actually what's important. Yeah. And so, and then lastly, we only take two special offerings a year here, one at Easter, one at Christmas. And on that weekend, we're believing God for a $350,000 offering, and we're going to be using that to help uh, establish uh, property to be able to buy that in the days to come for our Anna campus, as well as be able to fund some very important mission initiatives that we have in front of us. And so I'm going to ask you to pray 
about that. And I'm sharing this with you in advance so that you can pray, listen to God, and do what he says. And then last thing, this is so incredible, uh, for the first time ever, we've actually been working behind the scenes and we've created what we're calling the story of Easter. This is a 30-day guided journey. It's a book that's going to begin on March 3rd and lead us all the way into Easter. You're going to be able to buy it on Amazon, on Kindle. We're going to have a free version for you to download on our website. And this is going to be a guided journey that is going to give us all different things that we're going to be fasting all the way as we move towards Easter. Uh, There's going to be different daily reading. There's going to be daily uh, scriptures. There's going to be different gatherings. that You're going to have an opportunity to do this in your own family, individually, in life groups. There's going to be liturgy and opportunities to really dive deeper into the story of Easter, maybe unlike you've ever been before. And I just envision thousands of us going on this journey. And so you watch for that this week because we're going to be sending you information and I'd love for you to download that, get that, and let's do this together. So today, we're going to continue in on this series that we've entitled Breathing Room. And I want to talk to us about an area of breathing room that you've probably never even thought about. And it's the area of our morals. In fact, before we even jump into this, I want to ask you a question. How many of you know someone, and and let me just say this, before you answer, before you answer this, let me complete the question. Let me explain it in, in its entirety. How many of you know somebody whose life was absolutely messed up by sexual immorality? So how many of you know somebody that maybe they've struggled with pornography and it's wrecked their life? Or maybe you know somebody that they got pregnant before marriage and then they freaked out, they panicked, they had an abortion and now they live with the regret of that. Or maybe you know somebody that got pregnant before marriage and they just thought, man, I'm just gonna marry the jerk even though I don't even like him. Or maybe you know somebody that got pregnant before marriage and just thought, okay, I'm gonna have to raise this child as a single parent. Or maybe you know somebody that is plagued with an STD because of a one night stand. Or maybe you know somebody that's got a high body count and they bring that into a marriage and now there's all kinds of competition and there's, there's uh, uh, stress and there's anxiety and there's tension, and there's comparison. Or, or maybe you know somebody that they had an affair and it absolutely destroyed, it wrecked their marriage. So let me ask this question again. How many of you know somebody whose life was massively hurt, it was harmed, it was destroyed because of sexual immorality. Come on, how many of you? Put your hands up, put, put them up. Like, come on, I need, to, I need to see your hands, everyone. Come on, put them up. Look at that, hands everywhere. Here's the thing that I need you to understand today. Nobody thinks, you know what? My five-year goal, I wanna have an affair. Nobody does that. Nobody thinks, you know, I want to get so caught up in pornography that my mind becomes incredibly twisted and vile. Nobody thinks, hey, baby, this is the year I'm getting herpes. (laughs) Woohoo! Said nobody. Nobody thinks, you know what, if I play my cards right, I can get involved in some kind of sexual sin, and maybe I can lose my job, maybe I can lose my marriage, maybe I can lose my kids, my health because of an STD, or my respect, or my self-esteem. Nobody thinks like that. And yet the reality is, is that it happens all the time, right? Yeah. You know... Um, in 25 years of pastoring, one of the most common statements I've heard almost unanimously from those that have been involved in a sexual tragedy is, I never thought that it would happen to me. And the thing that every one of those that have been involved in a sexual tragedy have in common is that there is no moral buffer To which you're asking the question, Chris, what's a moral buffer? Well, let me give you kind of a working definition of that today. Moral buffer is putting a buffer between you and 
temptation. In fact, let me give you a great verse today on the topic of temptation. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire. Which, by the way, you remember last week I talked about the fact that we all are out of alignment, including the guys speaking to you. Like, we all have a bent away from God. We all have a bent towards sin. All of us. We're actually dragged away and what? Come on, everybody, what? Enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. The Bible says that all of us, we are being enticed and we are being dragged away. In fact, that word enticed in the Greek means this. It means to entrap, to allure, to entice, to hook. It's actually a fishing term. It's the exact thing that a fisherman does to be able to hook in, to entice in a fish. And you would need to know today that the Bible makes it very clear that your spiritual enemy, Satan, is doing everything that he possibly can do to see sin birthed on the inside of you because he knows that once sin is birthed, it becomes full growing. It does not lead to life. It will lead to death. You're being baited. You're being hooked. You're being enticed. You're being lured in to get to the point that you'll wake up someday and say, I never thought this would happen to me. You know, um, for the first 13 years of ministry, I was very privileged that I had the opportunity to speak into the lives of thousands and thousands and thousands of teenagers. And what's, what's amazing to me, so interesting, is that they would always ask me this question. They'd say, hey, Pastor Chris, you know, when we're dating, how far is too far? Right? Yeah. Now, that's an interesting question because... It's probably one of the only areas in life that we ask, how close can I get to something that can actually hurt me without getting hurt? I mean, nobody here is thinking, you know, I'm gonna take a revolver, put three bullets in that gun, spin that thing, and wonder. I wonder how many times I can pull the trigger and be okay. Nobody here thinks, hey, I'm gonna put my head in the, in the mouth of an alligator and look up at you and say, I wonder if I'm gonna be all right. <laughs> Here in Texas, we have poisonous snakes everywhere. There's been times I've been out walking our dog and I've seen a little copperhead on the ground. Never once, never once did I ever think, hey, snakey, wakey. <laughs> Let me see how close I can get to you without being bitten. And yet we do this in the world of sexual temptation all the time. In fact, Paul the Apostle comes along. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18. He says, we're to do what? Flee. 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 Doesn't say flirt. <laughs> Doesn't say get close to. He says flee from sexual immorality. And that word flee in the Greek is phogo. I mean, it's, it's this idea that it means to run away, to shun, to escape, to distance oneself. Notice this. The Bible doesn't say that we're to flee overeating. It doesn't say that we're to flee gossips. It says that we are to flee sexual temptation. Like, you need to make sure you put some distance between you and whatever that thing is. Like, just like Joseph, run, force, run. To which I know you're probably asking the question today, okay, Chris, why are you zeroing in on sexual sin today? And here's why, because it's the most dangerous. 
You know, in my life, I've known many, many, many people that have been very close to me that have been taken out by this one. See, sexual sin is different than all other sins. You say, Chris, what do you mean by that? Well, let me show this to you. Paul continues on in the same, same passion, uh, p- passage, same verse. He says, all other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. To which you say, well, hey, Chris, I thought that all sins were the same. Well, they're actually not. Here's the truth. All sin, yes, it, all sin separates us from God. But I could make a very strong biblical argument today that in the eyes of God, he does not see all sin the same. I mean, you even think about this from a practical standpoint. All sin doesn't cost you the same. You give a little white lie, probably nothing's going to happen. You speed, you might get a couple hundred dollars speeding ticket. You start gossiping, you may lose a friend. But you get involved in a sexual sin, and you could lose your job, your marriage, your kids, your health from an STD, your reputation, your self-esteem. All this from a decision that actually is going to affect your life for the rest of your life. The Bible makes it very clear. He says, all other sins that a man commits are outside of his body. But when somebody sins sexually, it's actually against your own body. In fact, he continues on in the very next verse. He says this, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Everybody, every day, you ought to look in the mirror and say these words. God lives on the inside of me. Whom you've received from God, you are not your own. You were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. To which you might think today, hey, it's my body. I can do whatever it is that I want to do. And I'll just say this, that if you're not a Christ follower, that's true. You can go hook up with it, smoke it, do it, whatever. I mean, drink it, whatever you want to do. But when you've surrendered your life to Christ, your body's no longer your own. You are now the temple of God. You are the home of God. God lives on the inside of you. Therefore, we need to honor God with our bodies. Here's the problem. The problem is that we live in a culture today that is constantly tempting us to get involved into sexual immorality. And it comes across and says, man, it's not that big a deal. It's just an animalistic activity. It's just recreation. It's just fun. Like, come on, man. Just take down those buffers. Take down those morals. Don't, you don't have to have boundaries because if you're a guy, you're going to want to do the bonka bonka. You know what I'm saying? Just go have fun. Yo, yolo, you only live once. Well, the, the truth is that's not actually correct because sexual sin sticks with you. It's painful. It's emotional. It's deeply spiritual. In fact, Paul the Apostle comes along and he says this in Ephesians. He says, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Not even a hint. Not even a hint. I'm going to tell you that the world's standards are so low, 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 low. But God's standards are very, 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 very high. And what I'm going to talk about for the next few moments today, you're going to have the tendency to look at me and go, dude, you're weird. (laughs) Darn straight I am. Unapologetically, like passionately weird. Because, hey, everybody, listen to me. Normal's not working in culture today. Have you looked at culture recently? 
this is not working. We have walked away from God's standard and we're seeing the byproducts of it. And at some point, somebody needs to stand up and say, hey, everybody, what in the world are we doing? We need to get back to God's standards. In fact, let me show you a stat here that I want you to see. According to one article, and I probably should have given you an opportunity to clap there because you were <laughs> gearing up for that. So there we go. <laughs> mm. But check this out. According to one article, 65% of men and up to 55% of women will commit adultery by the age of 40. And if you add in these numbers together, we actually discover that about 80% of marriages right now are being impacted by infidelity. That's normal. That's normal. Why is that normal? It's because we have no moral buffer. We have no boundaries. And now what's happening is that marriages are becoming really, 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 really difficult. How did it happen? I'll tell you how. I want you guys to watch this. So imagine in your mind, this is the adultery line right here. I mean, you, you don't want to cross that line. In fact, I'm far away from that line. I'm, I'm way over here. And so what we've started to do is we start thinking, hey, it's okay for me to have connection with somebody of the opposite sex and begin to talk to them about some very personal private things. And so I begin to talk to you about personal life stories and personal things about my husband or about my wife. And we think, man, the line for adultery is way, way, way over there. So this must not be wrong to share all of these personal stories. And then we think, man, I, I actually can't wait to see them the next day. I can't wait to be around them like I'm really looking forward to being with them. And, and this can't be wrong because the line for adultery is way, way, way over there. So this must not be wrong. And then we think, man, there's, there's nothing wrong with me giving them a little gift, sending them a little text, having this emotional connection with them. Because the line for adultery is over there and I'm not there. I'm right here. So this must not be wrong. And then we think, I just have to be true to myself. And I just got to tell you, I know that this is wrong, but I got to go with my heart and I got to let you know that I've been feeling these feelings for you for the longest time and I'm actually really attracted to you. And all of a sudden, before you know, come on here, little snaky snaky. <laughs> and we wake up one day and we think, I never thought it would happen to me. No moral buffer. No moral buffer. So here's what I'm going to do. For the next few minutes, I'm actually going to give you seven different moral buffers that I'm asking you to consider drawing a line in the sand. And some of you are going to listen to me today and think, Chris, you're weird. And others are going to think, Chris, you're wise. So let's go. Here's the first one. And that's this. Dress for spiritual victory. So, like, dress in such a way that you bring glory and honor to God. So, first of all, let me talk to the guys for a second, all right? Because honestly, there's probably not even any guy on the planet that's even attractive. So, this is not even really a deal for you, really. <laughs> you know? Really not. Guys, I'm so sorry, but we, we, we hit the ugly stick every way down that tree, you know? <laughs> But let me just say this, guys, let me, if you got a lot of muscles or something like that and you're in the gym, cover up, just have, have a little modesty, okay? But let me talk to the ladies just for a little bit longer here in this one, okay? So, ladies, here's what you need to know about men. We are very visual, so dress in such a way that you have spiritual victory. Please don't be a distraction. Listen, listen. I know you paid a lot for them. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
but keep them for your husband. <laughs> like, keep, keep it for him, okay? We, we don't need to see them, okay? Cover them up. I'm going to keep moving on because I probably just offended somebody here today, but y'all just going to have to deal with me, all right? Here, here's the second thing, and that's this. Keep four feet on the floor if you're dating. So it's amazing how safe you can be when you keep four feet on the floor when you're dating. So like, don't lay down on the bed together and think, well, we're just going to study the Bible together. No, your little legs are going to get entwined everywhere. Keep four feet on the floor. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says, ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. So in other words, if you're watching a movie and you're dating, keep four feet on the floor. Four feet on the floor. You say, Chris, that seems pretty extreme. Yeah, but it's pretty doggone safe. Because here's what happens. If you don't keep four feet on the floor, she's going to take her smooth, shaved legs and put it up on his hairy legs. And when smooth shaved legs touches hairy, hairy legs, all of a sudden, before you know it, clothes start flying off everywhere, and then it's pants on the ground, pants on the ground. You're looking like a fool with your pants on the ground. Whoa! Where were we on that? Okay. Keep four feet on the floor. Here's the third thing, and that's this. No, say no. I'm asking you to put some moral buffers in, okay? Say no to sleepovers or playing house. So this is very normal in culture right now, okay? Yeah, I come over to your house. We're hanging out. Oh, I didn't know it got so late. And I know that you live a little ways away. I got an extra toothbrush. You can use, you can use my T-shirt. We can just cuddle. Here's snakey, snakey, snakey. Pants on the ground. <laughs> Pants on the ground. You, you, you got to have some moral buffers. Number, num, number four, and this one's going to seem extreme, but if you're dating, no tonsil hockey. So, <laughs> this is not a thus saith the Lord. This is a thus saith the Chris suggestion. Okay, and here's why. Tatum and I, we waited until after we were married until we engaged in the gift of lovemaking. And we never, ever, ever had any sexual temptation until we kissed. And it was after we kissed. You know, your faces are closed, your bodies are closed. It was after that that sexual temptation went up. And it was after that, man, I just, I mean, I just couldn't keep her away from me after that. <laughs> I'm like, girl, man, this is getting ridiculous. Come on. Or something like that. I don't know. My mind's a little foggy and all that right now, but it was. And I know that some people are saying, hey, Chris, this just seems kind of extreme. Yeah, well, the, the normal in the world isn't working right now. And so if you want different results, you're going to have to do some different things. Here's, here's the fifth thing. I'd suggest that you stay clear of dangerous places. And you're the only one that knows what that place is for you. So for you, it could be a pub, it could be a club, it could be a certain chat room, it could be staying late at the office. It, for some of you, it could even be going to the gym because you just can't handle that visually. Like whatever that is for you, you're going to have to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and stay away from dangerous places. So I'll say like this, it's really easy for me to say no to a hot Krispy Kreme donut when I'm at home. Whole different story when I'm sitting there. That little conveyor belt is piping those things off. You see all that cream coming down on there, that frosting. You smell everything. The lady behind the desk says, the hot light's on. What would you like? <laughs> Do yourself a favor. Stay away from 
dangerous places. Here's the sixth thing, and that's this, monitor online activity. So let me talk to you about this one here for a second. So very honestly with you, when I was a kid, I remember it was my neighbor that exposed me to my uh, to his dad's stash of Playboy magazines. And honestly, years and years ago, when I was just a little kid, you had to work really hard to get content. Today, with the invention of the iPhone and the iPad and computers, you are one easy click away. And let me just say this to those that are of a younger generation right now. I don't even know... I'm just going to tell you that if I was in this generation right now, the, the access to temptation all around me, the access to everything, I just want you to know that I'm praying for you as your pastor. This pastor is not pointing his finger at you. This church supports you. We stand with you. We let you know that we're going to pray for you. It is the most difficult thing in the culture today to stand pure and right in a world that is full of filth. And you need to know that this church, I'm so proud of so many of our young men and young women, teenagers and young adults that are living pure and holy lives that are shining bright in the middle of the darkness. And I just need you to know that we're championing you, we're standing with you, we're gonna keep on supporting you. Amen. In fact, one of the big questions that's being asked right now is, hey Chris, what about AI? What about AI images? and AI videos. Like, is it, is it okay for me to be turned on by one of those? Because the argument is, is that it's not an actual real person. And I love the fact that Jesus, 2,000 years ago, was ahead of his time. I mean, he was, he was ahead of AI, because <laughs> that's my Jesus. And in fact, here's what he said. He said, man, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, it's as if you've committed adultery. He said this in Matthew. He said, the eye is the lamp of the body. So be very careful of what you're looking at. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, it's it's going to corrupt your relationships, your thoughts, your actions, your whole body will be full of darkness. You say, Chris, (laughs) what about you? You're a pastor. You're married. What about you? And I'll say it to you like this, that at my age right now, this is nowhere, this this is not the challenge that I had 20 plus years ago. It's just, it's just not. But if it ever was, there's different buffers that I have in my life. You see, what we've got to understand is, is that the world's technology is creating the access to sexual temptation. It's, it's being accelerated at ramped up speeds. And I'm just telling you, be aware, be aware of this. With the integration of virtual reality and quantum computing, in the next one to two to three years, it's all gonna become mainstream. And I'm just saying today that we're gonna have to be very keen. We're gonna have to be very aware that we are creating buffers around those that we love because the devil would love nothing more than to put a little hook out there with some bait so that you would wake up someday, sin would be full-blown in your life, and you would say, I didn't know. I never expected this to ever happen to me. Here's the last one I give you, and that's this. Avoid one-on-one time with the wrong people. You know, in the old days, I would have said, hey, avoid one-on-one time with people of the opposite sex. But in today's world, you need to avoid, sometimes you need to avoid one-on-one time with people of the same sex. So whoever the wrong people are for you, you need to make sure that you avoid one-on-one time in those intimate settings. 
See, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13, it says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. But whoever has a companion of fools, you're actually going to have a lot of difficulty in your life. A lot of harm is going to come your way. Let me tell you something. I've, I've warned my staff. I've told them, I said, hey, if you are ever in a counseling situation with a woman and you're listening to her and she's not had a man listen to her in a long time and you are affirming her qualities and you're telling her about how valuable that she is, I'm just telling you, you're going to become very, very attracted, attractive to her. She's going to look at you and say, wow, you care about me? Oh, yeah, I care about Well, can we join hands and pray? <laughs> oh, no, you don't, Pastor. You're going to extend your hands towards her in Jesus' mighty name with the door cracked wide open. That's what you're going to do. Sir, please listen to me. When's the last time you filled up your wife's emotional tank? Fill it up. Fill up her tank. Because women want their qualities affirmed. Now, guys are completely different. Guys want our abilities affirmed. Ladies, we want to know from you that you think that we're your superman, that, man, you did a great job. I'm proud of you. Man, I love how you led through that. I love how you lead our family. Like, we want our abilities affirmed. So just on Friday, Friday, I went outside and I dug a big old hole and I planted a tree. Tatum didn't say anything to me. So I went inside the house. I brought her outside. I'm like, hey, baby, look at that hole I'm digging. That's tough stuff right there. <laughs> I said, look at that tree that's in there. Come on. Because guys want our abilities affirmed. This is the difference between men and women. This is why a woman can be drop dead gorgeous. She looks in the mirror and all she sees is her flaws. And yet a guy can be fat and ugly, look in the mirror and go, what's up? You know, he walks out like, what's up, man? Let's go take on this world, you know? <laughs> Let me just say this to you. In your marriage, you, you better start affirming your spouse. Because if you don't, somebody else is going to come along and affirm them for you. I never thought it would happen to me. He said, Chris, are you really this extreme on this? The Bible says, flee sexual immorality. We've got to create moral buffers because the enemy is working overtime. He's trying to entice you. He's trying to bait you. He's trying to hook you into something so sin can be birthed on the inside of you. And when it is full grown, it will not produce life. It will produce death. And you will wake up one day and say, I never expected this to ever happen to me. The Bible says in the book of Romans, it says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. And so I just want you to know today, everybody, that I want to be the man of God that my son looks at and says, my dad's not perfect, but he's got a heart of purity. He seeks God because of the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. I want to be a father to my daughter that she would look at her dad and say, my dad is a, is a man that does not objectify women, that, she, that he treats my mom with honor and respect. And because of what I've seen modeled in the home, I'm going to go look for a husband someday that is just like my dad. I want, to, I want my wife Tatum to never have to worry. That she always can trust the integrity of my heart and my devotion to her. That, 
that I will always be somebody that will treasure her and care for her, provide for her, that she never has to worry. I want to be somebody that God, when he looks down at me, I want the God that sent his one and only son Jesus on my behalf, that bled and died and was massacred on a cross and found me in the mud pit of my life. Then he reached down into that mud pit and he put my feet on a solid rock. I want that God, my God, to look down and say, that's my boy, that's my son. His heart, soul, mind, and strength are pursuing after me. Like, I don't... I want more than what the world is settling for. So we're going to create moral buffers. The world's going to look at us and they're going to say, man, you're crazy, you're strange, that's fine. You watch at the byproduct of what this creates in our families, in our legacies, in our generations. We're going to shine bright for Jesus because if we follow God's word, his path, his plan, his ways work. His ways work work. Amen, everybody. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes right where you're at. You know, all day yesterday, I was praying for you. And here's what I knew. I knew that there would be many, many people listening to me today that this would would be a very painful message. Some of you, you you have a lot of guilt, a lot of regret. For some of you, you've almost found yourself, almost feeling like you're dying on the inside in this message. But you need to know that your God is the God of new beginnings. That your God wants to bring freedom into your life. That when the world and culture and yourself and the enemy has written you off, God says, no, no, no. What you thought is a setback is actually a set up for me to do something amazing in your life. So there's two groups of people that are here today that I think that the Lord is speaking to. Number one, there are those here that maybe you would be honest with God that you just don't have any moral buffers. And it's time for you to begin to implement them into your life so that you don't wake up one day and say, I never thought it would happen to me. Today's your day to yield to the voice of the Spirit of God. And then there's others that maybe you've been looking at some things or thinking some things, or maybe there's been some actions. Maybe you've been on that progressive journey towards an affair. Maybe you've already stepped over that line, and today's the day. You need to just text them right now and just say, I'm sorry, but it's over. Block that number and delete it. (laughs) Like, get serious. You say that seems extreme. No, it's, it's actually very sane. We're not going to allow the unholy reach of the enemy to get into our lives and corrupt the God-ordained future that he has for us. And so right where you're at, Father, I just pray for every person that's listening. This is a topic that is uncomfortable to talk about. It's not a church growth message. It's a church health message. And I just pray, God, that every one of us would take our, our inadequacies, our failures, our fallings, our temptations, our weaknesses, and the best that we know how, we put them in your hands. And we ask you, God, for your strength, for your help, for your hope. Give us courage and boldness to make the changes you're speaking to us about. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're listening to me today and you are away from Jesus, this is your moment to surrender to him. So come on, right where you're at, would you just pray this prayer? Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my my sin, my failures, all the times I've disappointed you, and I ask you to make me clean. Cleanse me on the inside. I declare that you are my God, my Savior, and my Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. And all God's people in the house, come on, say amen and amen. Come on, can we put our hands together and just celebrate so many that have gone from death to life. God bless you, everybody.